All right. Good evening and welcome to our Orthobiologic Medicine webinar. I hope everyone is ready for an interesting and informative discussion. We will get started in a moment, but first, please allow me to take a second to explain tonight's format. In a minute, I will introduce our panelists. To keep background noise down, all participants other than our panelists have been muted upon entry. However, if you notice that you have become unmuted, please go ahead and press that uh, red microphone um, so that we can help keep background noise down. We ask that you submit your questions via the Zoom chat feature, which you will find in your Zoom toolbar, and we encourage questions. Uh, feel free to submit those questions at any time. We will refer to them during the Q&A portion. Now for a brief introduction of OrthoSouth. Uh, we offer comprehensive orthopedic care across eight clinic locations in the Mid-South region. We have surgery centers in both Germantown and South Haven. And we are proud that our Germantown Surgery Center was recently ranked a Newsweek top ASC, that's Ambulatory Surgery Center in America. Uh, we're number two in the entire state of Tennessee. We also offer Saturday clinic hours in Bartlett, evening hours in East Memphis, and we welcome walk-ins at all locations. For those uh, after, after hours injuries, we even have an urgent care line that is available 24 seven that will connect you with a board certified surgeon who is ready to assist. Now to introduce our panelists. With us tonight, we have Dr. Judith Lee Sigler, Dr. Jonathan Stewart, and Dr. Bradley Wargo. Dr. Lee Sigler is a fellow of the American Board of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. She is a veteran of the United States Air Force to include service in Saudi Arabia during operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm. She specializes in non-surgical spine and orthopedic medicine, diagnostic and therapeutic injections, regenerative medicine techniques, spinal column simulator trials, electromyography and nerve conduction studies, and Botox therapies for migraine headaches and torticollis. And Dr. Lee Sigler, thank you for your service. Thank you, it's an honor. Dr. Jonathan Stewart is a fellow of the American Academy of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. He has extensive knowledge in non-operative regenerative medicine, interventional pain management, and electrodiagnostics. He served in the Navy as a battalion medical officer at the Naval Mobile Construction Battalion 1 in Gulfport, Mississippi, as a general medical officer at Branch Health Clinic Construction Battalion Center, Gulfport, and as the division officer for the Wounded Warrior Program at the Naval Medicine Center in Portsmouth, Virginia. And Dr. Stewart, thank you for your service. Glad to serve. And finally, Dr. Wargo is a fellow of both the American Society of Anesthesiology and the American Osteopathic College of Anesthesiologists. He is board certified in anesthesiology, pain management, interventional pain management, and regenerative medicine. He is the past chair of the American Osteopathic Board of Anesthesiology and past president of the Iowa Society of Anesthesiology and the Iowa Society of Interventional Pain Physicians. Additionally, Dr. Wargo is on the editorial boards of Pain Physician Journal and Interventional Pain Management Reports Journal. As a pain management specialist and anesthesiologist with more than 20 years of experience, he administers comprehensive pain management and anesthesia services to his patients in a holistic and preventative manner. And finally, briefly, a little bit about orthobiologics to get us started. Orthobiologics include treatments that use the body's own tissue and cells to help the body heal and regenerate. Commonly used orthobiologic treatments are platelet-rich plasma, bone marrow concentrate, and donated amniotic injectable. In the last several years, OrthoSouth has worked hard to review the evidence and develop our skills in this field. We have a team of physicians who are using orthobiologics in the surgical and non-surgical treatment of many orthopedic conditions. The orthobiologic team covers all of our clinic locations. Today, Drs. Lee Sigler, Stewart, and Wargo will share information on these topics, after which they will take questions. So now, without further ado, we will proceed, starting with Jonathan Stewart or Dr. Jonathan Stewart, I'm sorry. Either way works. <laughs> okay. 
Take it away, Dr. Stewart. All right. So um, a couple of topics to bring up tonight. Um, two areas of interest, uh, among others, I'll cover two of them. Uh, the first of those is uh, a treatment that's been around, which has been considered to be a regenerative therapy for some time. Uh, this is known as proliferative therapy or prolotherapy. Uh, treatment with prolotherapy started in the late 1950s to early 1960s uh, and has continued to be utilized <clears throat> by a number of different physicians, not only in the U.S., but also internationally. Uh, there is a foundation which is called the Hackett and Hemwall Foundation, um, which has attempted to um, expand knowledge about prolotherapy, uh, and they even sponsor mission trips to South America. I know of, I, I don't know about other areas, but I know they have a, an ongoing mission in South America. Uh, now, you may ask, what is prolotherapy? Uh, prolotherapy is generally an injection done with a hypertonic um, uh, dextrose solution, usually between uh, 10 and 25 percent um, dextrose solutions. Um, that is done by utilizing, utilizing a very um, commonly available uh, substance called D50. It's something that we typically have in clinics or even in uh, ASCs and hospitals. You start with the D50 and dilute that down to the appropriate concentration. Um, that is used to treat a number of different um, degenerative conditions, including tendinopathies, uh, as well as arthropathies or arthritis, as we commonly uh, describe it. Um, and over that time, uh, the Hackett and Hemwall Foundation has also sponsored research in this area. Um, and that's primarily done through the University of Wisconsin, uh, which is where most of the research can be found. Uh, regarding prolotherapy. Um, as I said before, this is, a, this is a treatment option that's been around for some time, um, perhaps not as widespread now as many of the other things, some of which we'll talk about tonight, uh, have come online and become more popular, but still remains a, a, a treatment option that's available. Um, the benefit of a treatment like prolotherapy is that it's very cheap to do. Uh, a vial of D50 uh, doesn't cost more than, than $10, which can be um, diluted with other um, either anesthetics or normal saline. Uh, and that also is why it has lent itself to be utilized in various other um, less developed countries where uh, complex and expensive treatments can be performed. Um, so it, it remains a good therapy, uh, perhaps not as robust as some of the other things we'll speak about tonight, uh, but it does generate a healing response as a result of the injection of that hypertonic dextrose solution into um, the areas that we're attempting to treat, be it mostly tendinopathy. So uh, into the tendon sheets, such as what you treat uh, with corticosteroid injections, kind of same location, or tendon origin, uh, which is also treated by corticosteroid injections. Now, uh, these kind of go along different pathways, divergent pathways, um, but a similar placement and delivery of the medication. Now, the other uh, topic that I wanted to introduce tonight, some of, uh, some of you all who are tuning in might um, have heard about this, might have been treated with this in the past, it's called platelet-rich plasma. Uh, platelet-rich plasma injections are basically um, taken from the patient's own blood. Uh, the whole blood is then placed into a centrifuge and that centrifuge allows us to concentrate that platelet-rich layer. The importance of concentrating the platelet-rich layer is that we get to deliver somewhere between five and seven times uh, normal plasma concentration of platelets into the area that we are attempting to treat. Now, uh, if you compare that to the prolotherapy that we mentioned before, uh, you typically get a more robust healing response with a platelet-rich plasma injection compared to a prolotherapy injection. The other benefit 
um, that most people recognize that PRP injections are platelet-rich plasma injections is that this is your own tissue. This is your blood. The risk of reacting to your own blood is nil. Uh, you can have uh, increased soreness after a PRP injection as a result of that robust healing response. But since it's same tissue, you're not going to reject it as you might something that's exogenous, something outside of your body. Um, PRP has been a useful treatment, um, more widespread starting in the early 2000s. There were some, there were some early uh, uses of both whole blood and um, somewhat concentrated um, whole blood, meaning conditioned plasma or various other things. Uh, prior to that development of kind of our, our current understanding of the proper concentrations to achieve what is called platelet-rich plasma. Uh, that started, like I said, in the early 2000s. Prior to that, in the uh, early 90s, you had some people experimenting with whole blood injections. And we have, over the last you know, 20 years, we have gained more and more knowledge about what the appropriate concentration of platelets is, uh, should that injection have either red blood cells or white blood cells, uh, and in what concentration we should have it. Um, and we can talk about that some further. One last point about that, you'll see some um, discussion in literature now about um, kind of two different types of, of PRP, if you will, uh, leukocyte rich and leukocyte poor. That refers to the concentration of uh, white blood cells also present in the injectate, injectate or the absence of those. Um, so there's, there's some thought that uh, the leukocyte rich um, PRP is better for uh, tendinopathies and ligamentous injuries and um, leukocyte poor being better in our interarticular injections. Um, and that's a topic for a discussion later. Melissa, did we wanna go to the next topic there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I apologize, I don't think I had, so we, di I, we didn't advance these slides. Um, it's okay. But we will move on to Dr. Uh, to Dr. Wargo, who will be discussing stem cell therapy and orthobiologics. Uh, good evening. Yeah, you can go ahead and advance this because we've discussed these things right here. Um, this is just a little background on like, like, like Dr. Stewart was talking about earlier, you know, the foundations of uh, what we call orthobiologics um, dates back to the 1930s with the onset or the invention of prolotherapy. Um, and over time, um, this technology has developed um, into what Dr. Stewart talked about with PRP. Um, and more recently, um, uh, uh, stem cell therapy. Um, Dr. Kaplan um, uh, coined the term sankimal stem cells, um, and stem cells um, are derived from our bone marrow, but they're located in other tissues also, um, primarily bone marrow and adipose or fat tissue. Next slide, please. So again, what is a stem cell? Um, you know, stem cells um, can be used to um, do lots of things um, to help in restoring tissue health and function. Um, they prevent and reduce inflammation. Um, they can differentiate into other tissue types once they're injected into those tissues, whether that be muscle, bone, or cartilage. And they also have the capacity to reproduce themselves. Next slide. Um, there's different types of stem cells. We talk about um, what are called prenatal stem cells, which are the stem cells that are um, uh, developed as the baby's maturing in the womb. And then the postnatal stem cells are the stem cells we have um, as we grow through adulthood. Um, again, these are primarily located uh, in bone marrow, um, but there's actually 100 to 500 times more stem cells in adipose tissue or fat tissue 
um, than there is actually in bone. Um, next slide. Um, stem cells, again, have the capacity to renew themselves. Um, and that's just a differentiation between that and what are called progenitor cells, um, which are similar to stem cells, but they're not able uh, to differentiate into all the different different cell types. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so again, where do we get stem cells? Um, typically, you know, these are harvested from bone. Um, and again, the advantage of this type of tissue is it is a, what's called autologous tissue, which means it's the own patient's tissue. So as Dr. Stewart alluded to with uh, PRP, um, there's not the issues of um, rejection um, because it is the patient's own native tissue. Next slide. Um, again, autologous bone marrow meets the FDA's um, guidelines for uh, non-clinical research use. Um, and so um, that's important when we're looking at um, avenues to help treat patients and help them restore their own function. And next slide. Next slide, Melissa. Okay, so this is just an illustration of how we harvest stem cells um, from what we typically call the posterior superior iliac spine, which is the, uh, the back of the hip bone of the pelvis, just because that's an easily accessible um, area of bone that generally um, produces enough stem cells for the therapies that we're performing. Um, and next slide. And once the stem cells are harvested, they're placed in the centrifuge to um, collect the cells that we need um, to utilize in the injections. And typically this process doesn't take more than 15 minutes. Um, this is just a slide showing normal healing process of tissues. Um, I'm not gonna get into the detailed uh, pharmacology um, and biophysiology of what's in the slide. I'm just knowing that um, whether we're injecting PRP um, or stem cells, it's aiding the, own, the body's own native ability to heal itself quicker. And next slide. Um, again, this is just an illustration of this at the skin level. Um, but as the body goes through the healing process, when there's damage or injury, there's normally bleeding. And when bleeding happens, um, pro-inflammatory cells come in and inflammation begins. And then that brings in other cell types that actually begin the healing process. Um, next slide. Um, and again, once the um, bone marrow is harvested and processed um, to collect the stem cells, those can then be injected into various tissues to aid the healing process, whether that's um, muscle, tendon, or joint, um, or even discs. Uh, next slide. Um, and just some forethought into the future here, um, Dr. Stewart again was speaking about um, uh, PRP. Um, another advancement in um, orthobiologics is um, injecting a PRP into um, vertebral bodies, which are the bones of the spine, um, when the, we have what are called modic changes, which are signs of uh, bone marrow edema. And if those progress, that can actually lead to a compression fracture. And so the hope is that this technology may help minimize um, the progression of bone edema into a fracture in the future to treat this bone before it actually fractures. And next slide. And I give it to you, Dr. Sigler. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I want to talk to you today about amniotic tissue. So amniotic fluid is rich in growth factors, proteins, and other factors that decrease inflammation and help heal scar tissue and support the healing process generally. And it's obtained from donations from healthy, fully screened mothers after an uncomplicated C-section. So once the mother's screened, if she decides that she wants to donate the placenta, the placenta is screened, is tested to be sure that it's free of disease, it is then sterilized and it is stored properly. And it's available in liquid form, it's available in, in a sheet form, and it's available in a powder form. 
So the same conditions that are treated by PRP and bone marrow can largely be treated by amnion as well. Then um, that includes tendinitis. Uh, many people have heard of plantar fasciitis. It can treat that and it can treat the osteoarthritic conditions as well. So why would one choose, for instance, amniotic tissue over PRP or bone marrow? Well, there's really no consensus on, you know, or, or on how one should choose. However, there are some general principles. So in general, if uh, one has had a recent cancer and the person's cancer specialist can't guarantee that it's safe to take at this point tissue from one part of the person's own body and put it in the other portion of a person's own body, even if it's been years, then that might be a time when one would use amniotic tissue. The same is true if one is of advanced age or if they've had some autoimmune disorders like lupus, that sort of thing. So I'll give you uh, an example of where this research uh, started. So much of the research or some of the initial research started at Harvard. And what they did was they took pairs of mice and they took a young mouse and a young and an old mouse and they took multiple pairs of these. And they took these little patches of dermis, which is kind of the part of the skin that and still has blood vessels in it. And they would connect these mice by these patches. And what they found is that the older mice would start to take on properties of the young mice or anti-aging properties. And then the young mice would start to take on properties of the older mice, so aging properties. They then found that you didn't even need the blood vessels to make that happen, that you can make that happen by just using the plasma. Uh, you could get the same effect. So you could even fast forward that and think of it the way that we are currently treating COVID-19. What do you do? You take one of the things you do is you take the plasma of someone who has had COVID-19, recovered from COVID-19, and you give it, you sterilize it, and then you give it to someone who is struggling with COVID-19 to help them recover faster. So these are just all variations of the same theme in terms of research that has led to the development of, of uh, amniotic uh, tissue being used. Uh, so generally in terms of side effects of using uh, amnion, they're really very few because uh, amniotic tissue is uh, very high in anti-inflammatory pro uh, products, uh, processes and it doesn't create a big uh, immune rejection response. And so generally there's some, there can be some stiffness and swelling that will last uh, about a week or two and, uh, and generally very minimal in, uh, in terms of side effects. Thank you. And with that, I believe we are ready to proceed to our Q&A portion of the uh, webinar tonight. And I have our first question. Um, someone asks, how is it determined where you put the injection, whether by x-ray or some other form of imaging? Uh, Dr. Stewart, would you like to take that question? Certainly. Um, so much in the same way that we would guide, you know, injections that we have done that are not regenerative therapy, first, we usually start with a history with the patient. So if you come in and say, hey, doc, I'm a runner, uh, my knee's been aching just below my kneecap for some time now, um, that guides our physical exam, right? We, we would then follow our history with a physical exam, uh, which would then point us in the direction of the, the source of the pain. Now, if we couldn't conclude that uh, perhaps uh, it was patellar tendonitis, uh, in the example that I just gave, that we needed some other type of study, such as an advanced imaging study, to kind of guide our therapy, then an ultrasound, a CT, an MRI, those kinds of things, as well as x-ray, can be done to refine our diagnosis, right? Once we've done so, um, then we can determine which structure we need to treat, uh, be it a joint, be it a tendon, be it a ligament, uh, what have you, uh, based, on, based on history, physical exam, and then our imaging studies. Excellent. And um, Dr. Lee Sigler or Dr. Wargo, do you have anything to add? No, the only thing that uh, I would add is that then at the time of the injection, 
Uh, it is generally our policy to use image guidance so that we're able to see the area again. So let's say for instance, that we determine that there is a tear of a tendon. So we see that, or it may be determined that that is true by MRI. And then when we look at it under ultrasound to do the injection, we will often have the MRI up at the time and then have the ultrasound probe on so we can see it and then we can deliver the material there. Excellent, thank you. Um, next question is for Dr. Wargo. What are autologous stem cells and where do you get them from? Um, so as we discussed, autologous stem cells are the patient's own stem cells. And so um, those would be stem cells that we harvest directly from the patient to be used for that patient. Um, and those can be taken again from bone marrow um, or from fat tissue, but currently um, the FDA only wants us to primarily use um, uh, bone marrow. Thank you. Um, the next question is general. Does insurance cover these different procedures? Dr. Lee Sigler, would you like to take that one? Sure. Um, most insurances do not cover these uh, procedures. There are some procedures that are covered by TRICARE under certain circumstances, and there are some procedures that are covered by certain workers' comp carriers under certain circumstances. Other than that, uh, the insurance companies continue to review this information and continue to review the studies related to it, but, have, but many of them have not yet uh, decided to cover them. Thank you. And Dr. Stewart, are these procedures done in an office or outpatient setting? Well, they can be done in both places. Uh, so typically at OrthoSouth, we do these in the office setting. Uh, those offices, as Dr. Lee Sigler mentioned previously, uh, where we have our image guidance equipment, uh, mainly the ultrasound to guide these injections. But they can be done in outpatient or ambulatory surgery centers as well, depending on which procedure you're doing. Thank you. Um, Dr. Wargo, does obtaining stem cells hurt? Um, anytime we do an invasive procedure, there's always the, the possibility of some discomfort. Um, but I will tell you that all of us strive very hard to minimize that as much as possible. And so um, anytime we're uh, performing a procedure uh, after sterilizing the area that we're working in, whether that's, you know, the knee or a shoulder, um, we will anesthetize the skin. Um, and if I am actually harvesting bone marrow, then I'll anesthetize the bone also prior to um, initiating the harvest. Um, these can also be done with IV sedation if necessary. Great point. Um... Dr. Stewart or Dr. Lee Sigler, do you have anything to add to that really good question? Yeah, I, the only thing that I would you know, say, I agree with absolutely everything Dr. Wargo said. And then for some people don't necessarily need IV sedation, but they can take, for instance, a Xanax or a Valium before they come in, because some people are very concerned even about the blood draw. So if you have a driver, you know, you can uh, have a Valium or Xanax just like you would if you were claustrophobic for an MRI and uh, that helps as well. Great point. I would echo the same and, and would also add that, you know, many times um, discomfort around the, the procedure is not related to procedure pain, but anxiety related to the procedure. And in those cases, uh, those anxiolytics like Xanax um, Valium, uh, other things uh, do help tremendously. Thank you all. Um, Dr. Lee Sigler, for what conditions can amniotic tissue be used? They can be used for much the same conditions as you can use PRP and bone marrow. So they can be used for tendonitis. So let's say you have a tendonitis in your elbow or your wrist or knee, it can be used for that. It can be used if you have a tendon tear. Uh, it can be used for plantar fasciitis. Um, and it can be used for osteoarthritis as well. 
Excellent. And I do want to take just a moment to say, if you have any questions to our audience, feel free to type those in and send them uh, my way. We do have several um, that we're going through, but I also wanted to take a moment to encourage you. Um, so here is another question. Um, I have heard that this, that orthobiologics and regenerative medicine can help avoid surgery. Is that true? And in what cases would that be true? Dr. Wargo? Um, sure, there's actually a very nice study that looked specifically at PRP and um, um, uh, necrosis of the femoral head. Um, and what they did was um, they compared um, uh, patients treated um, conservatively in both groups and then those that were treated with PRP um, and they were able to document that uh, 30 to 35 percent of people were able to delay or avoid um, total hip replacement um, after PRP injections into the hip joint itself. Wow thank you. Uh, Dr. Stewart or Lee Sigler anything to add? So uh, next question would be, uh, now how is uh, orthobiologic medicine and, and how are these injections different from other types of injections like steroids? Uh, Dr. Lee Sigler? Hey, that's a really great question that's discussed a lot in my clinic. So steroids have some great effects, right? They decrease inflammation and uh, they can help you feel better. And oftentimes people feel better very soon after it's done, but they don't really do much to help you heal and other than in the sense that they kind of, they decrease inflammation and that creates an environment where you can heal better. But over time, steroids can actually be toxic or bad for the cartilage and it can, it can make it actually degenerate more um, over time. In addition, steroids have other side effects that we know and don't like. It can increase your blood sugar. So if you're diabetic, you know, that can be an issue. It has other, you know, hormonal effect, you know, fluid retention, you know, various things of that nature. And so one of the differences is that you don't have, you know, those types of side effects and the orthobiologic products are not actually toxic or bad uh, in any way to the tissue. So that's, that is, um, a benefit for sure. Um, and then you don't have to worry about, you know, blood sugar and that, that sort of thing. So all of those things are benefits to using steroids, but there is a difference, you know, in the sense that oftentimes with a steroid injection, people feel better very soon. So if you take, and there's studies that show you take steroids and you take, for instance, PRP, I'll use it as, as an example, and you follow those people out and you look at them over maybe the first week or two, well, sometimes the, the steroid folks are doing much better, you know, at that period of time than perhaps the person that uh, got growth factors or who received stem cell treatment. But if you follow that out, because remember, we're looking at a process occurring of healing with the orthobiologic product. Uh, if you follow those folks out, that is where you start to see the differences between the steroid injection and the orthobiologic product. Great, thank you so much. Um, so when would or why would someone use the amniotic tissue over PRP or bone marrow? Uh, Dr. Sigler. Some of the examples would be, for instance, a patient who has had, for instance, prostate cancer. So they've had prostate cancer, they think they're in remission they want to have a regenerative medicine or orthobiologic treatment. And in that case, I would ask the cancer specialist who's working with that person, do you think it's safe for me to harvest their bone marrow and inject it into their knee? And the cancer specialist will consider that and they will either say, yes, I think it's fine, in which case I might use that, or they'll say, I am not certain that there are no cancer cells in this person's body. So I'm not, I don't know that I'm comfortable with you taking cancer from one place and putting it in another place in this person's body. That would be a really good opportunity to use amniotic tissue. Another time that it would be really good is someone who's a very advanced age. So, you know, the older we get, 
you know, the fewer signaling or stem cells we produce. And so for persons of advanced age, they might consider uh, using amnion. And then the same is true if they have certain, you know, uh, certain other diseases or disorders that might make it um, more, that they might want to choose to use amnion instead of using uh, PRP or bone marrow. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Wargo, what problems are stem cells used to treat? Um, stem cells are used to treat uh, a lot of degenerative problems um, we've kind of mentioned, including um, problems in uh, tendons, ligaments, joints themselves. Um, uh, we've also used them um, intradiscally for degenerative disc disease. Um, uh, there's a whole host of potential opportunities available because the hope is that um, what's different about stem cells compared to uh, PRP and other um, orthobiologics is that the hope that it will um, foster the growth of more normal tissue in that area. Um, and then I just would piggyback onto something that Dr. Lee Sigler said earlier about um, steroid injections. Um, uh, the other thing I would add to is, you know, steroids besides affecting your glucose or your blood sugars, um, they can also weaken your immune system. And so that is always something we all um, take into effect when we're looking at doing any type of injection therapy. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Stewart, um, would stem cell injections in the hips be done in the office or another yes. setting? Uh, that would be done in the office. Uh, you can both harvest and inject those, those stem cells uh, in the office setting. Now, in some places, uh, sometimes at Ortho South, not for the most part, uh, we do those in our office settings where we have the ultrasound available. Um, the ultrasound is the primary means of guidance for hip injection. Um, and yes, we can harvest those cells in the office as well. Excellent, thank you. So uh, when would you suggest to a patient uh, to use an orthobiologic treatment versus more traditional orthopedic options? Um, Dr. Wargo? I would say the mainstay or the main reason we would do those is be in a situation where we're trying to heal, um, uh, foster healing with a more recent injury um, to get somebody back to functional status as quickly as possible. Um, and then the other scenario is when they've got more chronic degenerative problems that are preventing them from forming activities of daily living and we're trying to improve their function um, with an orthobiologic. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Stewart or Lee Sigler, anything to add? I would, I would uh, add some on to that. Not, um, you know, just to expand upon that. You know, the idea that we can help pain with steroids is, is well known, right? Uh, we, many of us have had corticosteroid injections. We all treat with corticosteroids. Uh, but if you think about it, corticosteroids take us in a different avenue, take us in a different way uh, than do regenerative therapies. Uh, as mentioned previously, they do help with inflammation, but they also somewhat stop the healing process, right? Um, so some of those things that Dr. Lee Sagler and Dr. Wargo were mentioning previously, um, they happen as a result of how those steroids affect the healing process and how they decrease inflammation in the body through the arachidonic acid cycle. So if some of those things are inhibited, well, not only do we inhibit the bad things that happen, the pain, we also inhibit the good things that happen, which is remodeling of that tissue and restructuring of that damaged tendon per se. You know, so um, regenerative therapies do take us in a different way. They take longer to get there sometimes, but they do build more resilient tissue in the end. Very interesting, thank you. Um, the next, and I do want to just remind everyone, if you have any other questions, feel free to send those in. We do have a couple um, more um, coming in right now. Are there any risks to these treatments that differ from the risks associated with the traditional uh, orthopedic therapies? And Dr. Lee Sigler? 
basically the risks are the same and to some degree less than some of the others. So you can have swelling at the site, uh, you can have some stiffness and one can have some pain. And normally we will give you instructions regarding that. We'll give you tools to help manage that uh, so that it is tolerable for you. Um, but some of the other things, the side effects that steroids can have, you don't have to worry about with the orthobiologic options. So anytime anyone gets an injection for anything, so anyone, anytime anyone pierces the skin for anything, there's risk of infection. So we're very careful to tell you, you know, keep the area covered, that sort of thing. When we do bone marrow, we normally use the antibiotic patch you know, on there and then put the dressing over that to keep you from, or to keep anyone from having an infection. Bleeding, uh, generally we uh, tell people to come off of things uh, if their uh, other doctors allow so that they don't bleed. And again, you know, Band-Aids uh, and, you know, keeping, you know, pressure on the area initially. Um, but generally those are the side effects, some stiffness, some swelling at the site, um, but you don't generally have any systemic or any other uh, effects that would be worrisome. Great, thank you very much. Would anybody else have anything to add? Excellent. So um, this next question is, I'm interested in um, one or more uh, in these therapies and I'm wondering what my next step is. How do I, do I make a, uh, an appointment directly with one of you, or do I need to see my primary care first? And uh, Dr. Stewart, would you like to take that one? Sure. Typically, patients will make an appointment uh, with one of us who, who uh, treat with these regenerative therapies, uh, where we can discuss the issue to be treated, and we can discuss the most appropriate next step. Uh, but it is as easy as just making an appointment even online. Fantastic. And um, that is a great reminder that we do have online appointment booking um, at orthosouth.org. This is the last question that I have for the moment, unless anyone else has um, more questions to add. Uh, what are the side effects of using amniotic tissue products? Um, and I think we've already gone over some of this, but Dr. Lee Sigler, if you could just um, very quickly remind us. Sure. So generally the side effects are some swelling at the site and stiffness. So for instance, if I am injecting in a joint, that knee can be stiff for several days afterwards, that would be considered normal. Uh, one can have some swelling, uh, generally not a lot of swelling, and that also can be considered normal. Um, those are generally the side effects of using uh, amniotic tissue. Thank you. Um, one more question. So I have um, arthritis in my knee and um, I'm progressing towards where it looks like I will eventually need a knee replacement. Will, uh, would orthobiologic therapies help me avoid that surgery completely? Or will I eventually, would, it, would they just potentially help me uh, delay? Uh, Dr. Wargo? Um, I think in that situation, if, if a joint is degenerated to the point where the surgeon is considering joint replacement, then what we're looking at is um, avenues to help control pain and preserve function, as well as hopefully delay joint replacement. But if a joint is to the point where it's bone on bone or there's loss of motion um, necessitating a joint replacement, then, then our goal is to help preserve function, again, reduce pain and hopefully delay surgery, but I would not speculate that we'd be able to prevent surgery in that circumstance. Great, thank you. All right, the next question is, and I hope I do not mispronounce this, I had Dupuytren's contracture release five years ago, several steroid shots, but my hand has contracted again could something like this help my hand? Uh, Dr. Stewart. Yeah, Dupuytren's contracture um, is kind of an interesting animal. Um, and with regenerative therapies, 
I haven't known that to be treated uh, in that way in the past because if you think about Dupuytren's contracture, it is almost like a hyperfibrosis, right? So you have an abundance of fibrotic tissue within the tendon, which prevents um, full range of motion. And that prevention of full range of motion is what becomes very bothersome and it it impacts function, um, particularly as we see it in the hands. Typically speaking, uh, regenerative therapies uh, have not been used to treat that type of condition. Um, so a, a Dupuytren's contractual release would still be an appropriate treatment uh, in that area, unless the others uh, have knowledge of that that I don't have. Dr. Lee Sigler or Wargo, anything to add? All right. If I agree with one, Dr. One addition, uh, the next question. Oh. Melissa, if I will, if yeah, I go ahead. one additional thing to say about that. One of the important things that we've seen Uh, not only with uh, PRP and stem cell, uh, but very uh, eloquently illustrated with amniotic tissue has been the modification of the remodeling that happens on SCAR. Um, One of the areas where amniotic tissue was first used was in hypertrophic SCAR formation um, and also in burn patients. So One of the very interesting things is that, you know, when our tissues are damaged and when when they undergo healing as they do and and are very capable of doing, sometimes what happens is we have an abundance of scar tissue. Well, that abundance of scar tissue, um, while uh, a, a healthy reaction in some ways, can also be a hindrance to healing in some ways. It can reduce range of motion within a joint. Uh, It can produce continued pain. And these, these regenerative therapies, PRP, amniotic tissue, and stem cells in particular, have been shown to almost modify the way that those scars are remodeled over time. Uh, referring back to one of Dr. Wargo's slides from earlier, you know, our, our tissues go through a number of stages during the healing process. Well, remodeling is that final phase, right? So that happens over a period of months to years. And sometimes that happens in an overabundant way, which produces that um, kind of limit of function. Well, the regenerative therapies are kind of a good step there that prevents that hypertrophic scar formation. And thus far, will re- will produce a, a improvement in function. Very good. Thank you. Uh, we do have another question. How often would you need to have these types of injections done? Is it multiple injections within a specific time frame, uh, Dr. Wargo? Um, it depends on the modality that we're talking about. So, um, you know, um, both prolotherapy, stem cell, and PRP, and as well as amnion, you know, there's different protocols we use depending on the types of um, injections we're doing, the types of tissue we're treating. Excellent. And that leads to another question. So what types of injuries are you more, most typically treating? Are these often sports injuries, injuries related to um, degenerative uh, joints, or is it just an assortment? Uh, Dr. Lee Sigler? Yeah, it is an assortment. So sports injuries, uh, overuse plantar fasciitis, um, Arthritis, particularly if they're in the mild to moderate stages, I can you know can be very well treated with this. There was one other thing that I wanted to add to another answer that I gave, and it had to do with some of the indications or when would you use these products as opposed to not. And one of them is, let us say that you have a person and they have arthritis or they have a tendon tear but they can't be cleared for surgery. So their surgeon has offered surgery and their cardiologist, their heart specialist has said, no, I'm I'm not gonna clear this person. Their heart function isn't good enough. I'm afraid they would have too many complications. In that case, um, that would be another instance where orthobiologics can be used. Great. Um, Well, 
we seem to be wrapping up. We've got just a few minutes left and I think we have um, completed our questions. I'm gonna let each of our uh, panelists go through and um, make a couple moments of closing remarks before we um, complete our session tonight. Uh, Dr. Lee Sigler, starting with you, do you have any final words? Yes, first I wanna thank everyone uh, who attended. And the second thing I wanna say is that at Ortho South, we have made a rigorous process of developing our orthobiologics division. You know, we started in committee, we started with researching uh, what was out there with the experience that we already had to come together as a committee, uh, getting the literature, making sure that we were using the most rigorous protocols for the companies that we use and the techniques that we use. We continue to meet in committee uh, with regard to this and we continue to kind of have a library that we keep of evidence and papers to support the work that we do. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Stewart, you have final words? I do. Uh, just, a, just a word about personal experience with these regenerative therapies. Um, as a lifelong athlete, I've had a number of different you know, musculoskeletal issues over the years, um, including tendinopathies and arthropathies, particularly in my case, um, rotator, rotator cuff tendinopathy most recently. And, you know, not only can I attest to the, the effectiveness of these treatments, uh, in the patients that I've treated, but in myself, I've been treated with PRP uh, and amniotic tissue products um, and have found to be both to be very effective in treating uh, both pain and restoring function. So, um, you know, as the, uh, as the hair club ad used to go, uh, not, not only the president, but also a member, you know, it, 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 it works, <laughs> the stuff is, it's good. Excellent, thank you. And Dr. Wargo, your final words. Um, I would just point out that just like Dr. Lee Sigler said, you know, um, everything we do, we do based on what's called evidence-based medicine, which means um, we're not going to uh, try to push, you know, flim flam or snake oil. Um, we're gonna use um, heavily researched and verified techniques that have been shown to be effective to treat the specific conditions that we're addressing. Um, and as to, you know, why these are not covered, um, um, for FDA clearance for many treatment modalities or many types of uh, procedures, it takes years upon years of developing um, evidence to show validity for the procedures that we do. And that's what the insurance carriers will then use to decide if they're going to cover it. Um, because as an individual pain physician, you know, I can tell you that there's procedures that I've been doing for decades that have been shown to be very effective, but insurance still doesn't cover them, even though they're still considered standard of care. And so um, these are things will, that eventually will happen for orthobiologics. It's just gonna take time. Um, in the present time, unfortunately, a lot of these things are, are not paid for by insurance and those would therefore be patient responsibility. But um, we're all very happy to help patients. Excellent. Well, thank you all three of our panelists for joining us tonight for this great discussion. Thank you to everyone who um, came out to our audience and for all of your questions. If you ever have any other questions, please do not hesitate to call us 901-641-3000 or you can email me at mkandel at orthosouth.org and I will find a physician to answer your question. Um, or visit our website at orthosouth.org and your answer might be right there. Um, we thank you again. And we hope that you have a wonderful evening. Bye. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thanks, night.